All right, yeah, I think we, uh, we found the Zodiac killer. Well, I'm not keeping my contacts in plain English. Best quality vacuum? <sighs> hey guys, Pete here. There was a point in the first two episodes of Better Call Saul's final season where it got hard to imagine a way out for Nacho. No matter how much you wanted things to turn out differently, a happy ending was hard to imagine. After the sixth episode this week, I'm starting to feel the same way about Kim. The episode turned out to be the final installment in the setup trilogy that's been unfolding over the past few weeks, and ended with a point of no return moment, a literal U-turn towards a terrible choice, and it feels like there will be consequences. I'll get into how we got there and what it all might mean after this quick spoiler warning. If you haven't watched Better Call Saul Season 6 Episode 6 yet, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. In Axe to Grind, there's a long shot of a young Kim Wexler through the passenger window of her mother's car as it drives away from a close call. Her mother has just told her to relax, you got away with it. But it doesn't look like she's able to do that while she's internalizing what just happened. On the one hand, she was just saved from getting in trouble, and even got to keep the earrings she was trying to steal after her mom re-snatched them on the way out. These are earrings that were instantly recognizable as something she wears as an adult, even to someone like me who doesn't pay a lot of attention to jewelry. On the other hand, as was pointed out in the flashback to Nebraska last season, this is not a happy childhood for the future attorney. Because her past has been a mystery to us, the line that her mom delivers, I didn't know you had it in you, is an idea that seems to keep emerging in her story. Jimmy didn't think she had it in her to follow through to take down her old boss at HHM. Howard didn't think she had it in her to walk away from Schweikert and Coakley on her own, and is currently oblivious to her involvement in what's happening to him. And as viewers, it would have been hard for us to imagine that she had it in her to turn down this offer she's presented with by Cliff Main in this episode. It makes me want to imagine there's one more I didn't know you had it in you that relates to her getting out of this unscathed, but it's getting harder to imagine how that might happen, and we'll definitely be coming back to that. As far as their plan's concerned, while it's never spelled out directly, I do think we can put it together based on what we see in this episode. And as far as their victim, he does still use the kitchen in his lovely looking house, but is currently residing in the guest house along with his wardrobe. He's doing his best to get along with his wife who we meet for the first time, but their conversation says that things might be worse than we thought from his remarks at the therapist. You watch him craft an amazing looking cup of coffee that includes a peace sign in the foam. And the way Cheryl dumps it into her travel cup without an acknowledgement or even cleaning up the mess she makes pretty much says it all. She doesn't seem very interested in what he tells her about Jimmy or very convinced that he'll take care of it. And she doesn't even say goodbye on her way out. It's all pretty harsh and it all kind of reinforces this idea that he doesn't deserve what's happening. And it'll add to the impact when their plan plays out. At the office, he gets a detailed report of all of Jimmy's comings and goings from his private investigator. The only thing out of place is a trip to the bank to withdraw what looks like $20,000 in cash. Howard believes he's catching Jimmy in the middle of something here, since there's no legal reason for him to be doing that, but we'll get confirmation later that this is all part of their plan which also includes a trip to see the shady veterinarian Caldera. Or maybe it's more accurate to say that he's shady and a veterinarian, because honestly, he seems to be pretty solid as far as taking care of animals is concerned. They go to him for a drug that will dilate Howard's pupils, and presumably make him look coked out during this mediation session for the Sandpiper case. This corresponds with the call that Jimmy has Francesca make later to HHM so that they can get access to listen in. This is the big event, the culmination of their plan that they've taken to calling D-Day. And if it works, Howard's reputation will be called into question in front of all of these important people, and they'll have to settle the case. Caldera assures them that it won't show up in any drug screens, and he seems confident that it's safe. 
The one thing he mentions that might turn out to be important, though, is that the effect is dependent on the person's tolerance for caffeine. And in the earlier scene where Howard's making the cup of coffee for his wife, you notice that even though they have this really great espresso maker, which he's very good at operating, he actually takes tea. So that might be something to keep in the back of our minds. The vet also mentions that he's on his way out of the business of being the guy you come to when you need something like this, when you need to connect with a criminal. He just needs to sell his black book and then he's leaving town. Jimmy can't believe that he would walk away from this great, nearly passive income stream. But Kim says he knows what he wants, which I guess is her recognizing herself in him. But also, we don't actually see how it goes down. But this book does show up inside Saul's house in the episode one opening teaser. Also, in case you missed it, Ed the Disappears card is inside and Kim looks at it. We know he'll play an important role in the creation of Gene, but we're going to have to wait to find out how they come to be in possession of the black book and the card. The last part of the plan is to fake some photographs of Saul passing the $20,000 off to an actor who looks like the retired judge who Kim found out was handling the mediation from Viola. They bring in the film students, they put all that together, and everything looks like it's going to go off perfectly until Jimmy goes to buy a celebratory bottle of Zafiro Añejo at the liquor store. There he runs into the actual judge and notices that he has a broken arm. Jimmy thinks they need to abort because now the photographs won't be convincing. And at this stage, Kim should be able to let it go. Because the other thing that happened for her this episode is that deal with Cliff I mentioned earlier. He came to see her in action in one of her pro bono cases. She was making a great argument to get evidence thrown out because the arresting officer used a flimsy excuse for probable cause. And during that, we got a what seems to be unrelated reminder of Jeff the cab driver's air freshener from the season four gene scene. After Cliff checked on how she left things with Howard, where she told him that she owes him a lot, he explains there's an opportunity where a major source of funding for justice reform programs is expanding to the Southwest. She would still have to go to a meeting and convince them, but Cliff thinks she's a lock and that she would probably get the funding she needs to do what she wants for her pro bono practice. She's excited. Jimmy is maybe even more excited. And the only catch was that the meeting was happening on D-Day. Jimmy assured her that she didn't need to be there. And this is a ticket to her dream anyway. If this goes through, they don't need the Sandpiper money. And that's why it's hard to understand her decision. She was already on her way when he made the call about the judge having the cast. He gave her the out of saying they should just live to fight another day. And still, after some thought, she says it happens today and makes the turn back to see this plan through. The way it was presented, it doesn't sound like she'll get a second chance at a meeting. And we have to imagine that she thought of this while she was making that decision. If she keeps going, she gets what she wants by doing the right thing. And I describe this as a point of no return because this was her chance to go the other way. If she just keeps driving, she's got a promising career doing good for the less fortunate. And even if that falls through, she's got a husband that loves her and is supportive. When she makes the turn, she's putting all of that at risk and putting everything she has into pulling off this scam to basically get the same things, only in this version, Howard looks ridiculous. It's frustrating, but it's also fascinating. It's hard to watch, but I can't look away. In the video I did about their motivations, I touched on the idea of her being driven by something deeper. To play with the episode's title, she definitely has an axe to grind. I don't know that the opening sequence clears that up. It does add another layer, and of course people are complicated. I feel like it makes some sense about why she's drawn to Jimmy, and how she handled situations in earlier seasons. More than anything though, it just makes it feel like we're at the place where it's all or nothing. And I don't know what will happen next, but won't likely stop thinking about it until we find out. There were also some other things that happened in this episode. Francesca went wild decorating the strip mall office. She's got a flair for a vibe that's professional and refined and, you know, inviting. It's funny that there's probably a connection to the way both the furnishings and her disposition change to match what they're like in Breaking Bad. 
We didn't get any Gus sightings in this episode, which might be related to the fact that Giancarlo Esposito did a pretty good job directing it, but we did get some time with Mike. He got a call about using resources to protect Stacy and Kaylee, and made it clear that he wouldn't be backing down from that when he talked to Tyrus. This might have been a little superfluous, but I thought it worked pretty well. It pointed out how difficult this situation is. This is across the board for Gus's whole organization, more or less. And also to show how dedicated Mike is. And I thought that made sense considering the last thing we have to talk about showed how dedicated Lalo is. He's still in Germany. He made his way to the remote house that Casper's living in. He found out where that was by going to talk to the people who made the slide rule memorial for him. In case you forgot, he was the worker who told Mike that Werner was worth 50 of him before he returned to Germany. He wasn't expecting any visitors and decides to run and hide whenever he sees this man come into his backyard through the forest. That part of his plan wasn't all that bad. He does end up getting the jump on his pursuer when he follows him inside a barn. The only problem was that he decided to hit him with the back of his axe instead of just killing him. Unfortunately, Lalo isn't the kind of guy you want to have a conversation with under these circumstances. And after Tony Dalton does a really great job of convincing me he can barely breathe, he uses a concealed razor to slash Casper, then takes the opportunity to use his axe to cut off his foot. Lalo gives him his belt to stop the bleeding so he can ask him what Gus was building, and then I imagine he'll put him out of his misery before he leaves. And with that, we've made it through the setup, and now we'll get to see if the payoff was worth it. I like this episode a lot better than last week's. It was mostly the same, but we were able to put together what was happening with the plan. Last week it seemed like they were teasing us a little bit, not really giving us details. And this time they didn't come out and tell us, but they gave us everything we needed to put it together. They're going to use the PI, who I'm not sure is in on this or not, but he's giving Howard this information, and they let him think that he found something. So when he sees these photographs, he's going to think that Jimmy's trying to bribe the judge, and after they give him the drug to make it look like he's really high, he's going to make a baseless allegation. Jimmy will be able to call in and listen to it all go down, and it did seem like if it plays out that way, it would work. I really enjoyed the flashback and thought it was impressive how much they managed to flesh things out in that five minute sequence. The actors who play Young Kim and her mom do a fantastic job of resembling Ray Seahorn and matching some of her mannerisms. And the little touches like her nervously bouncing her foot and still wearing those earrings are fun. It's also interesting to compare this to season 5's flashback. In that, Kim wouldn't take the ride home with her mom who was late because she'd been drinking. She was willing to walk miles carrying a cello to stand by her principles. In this one, she's showing that she does indeed have it in her, and also that she's willing to accept her mother's help when she needs it, and possibly because she wants something. She can be surprising, and that's something we've seen in small moments throughout the series. The show's been about Jimmy McGill transforming into Saul Goodman, and since it's a prequel to Breaking Bad, and we know him in that show, it's natural to make comparisons between his transformation and Walter White's. Now you can't help but think of making the same comparisons with Kim. There's the idea of did situations that came up create the character, or did it cause who they really are to come out? And when you look at all three, I think you come up with different answers. I thought the D-Day and Omaha Beach references were pretty interesting too. That was a successful mission, but a lot of soldiers lost their lives in service of that. I think it's safe to say that there's going to be casualties with their plan as well, and if Kim and Jimmy are worried about that, they probably should have chose a different name. There was a lot of good Breaking Bad references here, and it was nice to see Caldera come back. I thought it looked really good, and I thought there was some great editing in this one. I really liked the cut from Jimmy and Kim celebrating, to Casper's axe chopping wood, and then to the laundry from Jimmy holding the client who was peeing in his water feature. The mid-season finale is next. It genuinely feels like things won't be the same after this next episode, and I think that that's probably a good place to leave things. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this episode, what you think about what's going to happen next, and what you think it all will mean about the second half of the season when it comes back. 
and join us for the live stream at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Tuesday so we can dig a little bit deeper. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.